For centuries, we in the West were enthralled by ceramics from China and by blue and white in particular. 50,000 and 700,000, any more, 700,000. But what we didn't know was what the Chinese had been making for themselves. Over there, emperors, scholars and collectors were entranced by something completely different. Deceptively simple forms, many of them subtle monochromes, a whole species of ceramics never seen in the West. Then, in 1860, Western troops rampaging through Beijing and pillaging the Emperor's summer palace found these ceramics, a kind entirely new to them. Imagine the greed which filled the British and the French troops when they entered these ransacked palaces to discover that they were absolutely crammed with porcelain. The troops had blundered into a treasure house, revealing an aesthetic completely different to their own, one which emphasized just how mysterious the people of Cathay were. Now for something really antique. In the 1920s, one Englishman set out to build a collection of such pieces. Through these wares, Percival David believed he could bring the West into a closer understanding of the East. I think he was right. I believe that through these wares, we can reveal aspects of Chinese society and character. To me, they are China in ceramic form. These beautiful objects are time travelers. They'll take us on a journey through a thousand years of ceramic history to the 12th century capital of the academic Sung dynasty. Gleaming blue and white porcelains will carry us to the 14th century, the Yuan era, and then we'll be in the 18th century and the Forbidden City for the beginning of the end for the Qing emperors. I've set myself a real challenge. I'm going to take half a dozen ceramic items and I'm going to see whether through them we can get an understanding of an entire civilization. For me, the urges began in adolescence, but I was 21 before I actually touched any imperial porcelain. Well, my first experience of um, actually handling pieces made for the emperors uh, was as a young probationary specialist at a well-known auction house. I got to play with the toys. I just was in heaven. There is a huge world of difference between seeing an object through glass in a cabinet and actually getting your hands on it. In the West, we don't actually value um, the notion of feeling an object as much as they do in the East. You're in, in direct contact with the people who made this whenever it might have been. There was one collection above all which uh, I wanted to get my hands on. The celebrated Sir Percival David collection. Inside Pekin is the Forbidden City, is where emperors once lived in barbaric splendor. Percival David began collecting ceramics in his 20s, just as the imperial system ended. He had legendary taste and remarkable access. The Percival David collection is the finest collection of Chinese ceramics outside China. The great collector was born in India in 1892 into a dynasty of merchant princes. He first visited China in 1923. He's entering China at a time that's quite exciting in terms of the art world. We're seeing a lot more ancient things appearing in the market. He was paying top dollar um, for many of the objects he acquired. But of course, you know, he had the funds to do that. Today, the collection is on public display at the British Museum. He felt that he was so fortunate to have direct experience of China and of Chinese things outside of China. And he was one of the lucky few who could purchase what he really wanted. He wanted to share that. Museums like statistics. The average visitor to the British Museum dwells in a gallery for 174 seconds. But in Gallery 96, the average stay is seven minutes. Now, in those seven minutes, 60% of the people asked what was it like visiting Gallery 96, put it down to an emotional and a spiritual experience. And I'm sure that Sir Percival would have been very pleased. 
many visitors are Chinese. I believe they're reporting more than the spiritual uplift that comes from expensive antiques. I think it's a response to an enigma. These vessels are ancient, but unchanged by the passage of time. They reverberate with bygone eras. It's just a question of listening for the echoes. I've chosen five pieces from the Percival David collection and one from modern China. They're all old friends of mine, pieces I've known for years. Now, I won't just be looking. Well, you've got a massive pair of vases. Is this? For three decades, I've handled ceramics without price and sometimes without value, but always with care. But this is different. Handling these pieces calls for control of one's nerves. Many are priceless. They're all fragile. My first choice may come as a surprise, but to me, it's a minimalist masterpiece. This is a film about beautiful objects. To many people's eyes, this is no more than a dog bowl. I think this is exquisite. White, porcelain, the material that we, above all, associate with China. This has an ivory feel to it, cold to the touch, but smooth as satin. This was made at a time when there were no enamels, there were no colours, but you could decorate it by scratching or carving a design into the surface. And you can almost see the hand movement of the potty. He will use a wire or a little cutter and turn the basin round and he'll get this beautiful flow. For me, that's one of the most satisfying tests. When you look at it, does the design make you want to turn it round? Does it have life? Does it want to rotate itself? It sounds a bit highfalutin, but that's the way it is. And then in the centre, we have this beautiful array, not only in the centre, but on the inside of that galleried rim. And my word, the copper band just gives it this presence to think that uh, the Normans were still rampaging over England at the time this was made. This basin was made around the end of the 11th century AD, an example of what is called dingware. It was designed for the use of an intellectual or scholar, and it opens my first window onto a particularly Chinese trait, the respect for learning and for the learned. In all sorts of different walks of intellectual life, there's a very powerful tr Chinese tradition of scholarship. It might be about art, philosophy, or food, or music, and it is distinctive from our own. 11th century China was ruled by the Song Dynasty, emperors to whom scholars were heroes. In Chinese society, people were ranked according to their profession. At the top was the scholar, then came the farmer, then came the artisan or craftsman, and right at the bottom was the merchant. When the Song came to power, scholarship was greatly revered, and being able to read and write and appreciate your venerable past was a most important quality. But academic excellence was of less importance than athletic prowess. When in 1127, marauding Tatar forces chased the Song out of their capital, Kaifeng, they fled south to a city that is today called Hangzhou. I wanted to see the town where the Sung found refuge. Hangzhou sits in a natural hollow by a picturesque lake with a gentle climate perfect for growing tea. The Sung court had been through hell. This was heaven. The Southern Sung dynasty, as they're known today, began to make their new capital a thriving metropolis and a center of academic excellence. So naturally, they left good records. The urbane citizens of Hangzhou had a bewildering choice of evening classes for those interested in the sciences and the arts. There was a choice of the early music society, the horse 
Owners Appreciation Society, the Girls Choral Society, the Calligraphy Society, and all sorts of other interests, including the Ghost Hunters Society, the Exotic Food Enjoyers Society, and the Antique Collectors Society. Now, that's one 12th century club I should love to have attended. <laughs> To run their very civil society, the Sung required a civil service. Examinations were open to all and standards were high. Pushing a pen or rather a brush required fluency in the classics and dexterity with the scholar's tools. Calligraphy is really at the base of any scholar's performance. The scholar surrounded himself with useful utensils on his table. A whole array of objects that would have helped you with the pursuit of your writing or your painting. But you didn't want to use something that was ugly. You wanted to use something that would lift your spirits. And each of these would have been beautiful in its own right. Our bowl is such a tool. Chinese calligraphy is more than just writing, it's art. Song officials had to paint words, or rather characters, beautifully. At the Hangzhou Art Institute, the scholar's tools still include the ink, the brush, and the bowl to rinse one from the other. The dingware basin is almost certainly a brush washer. This is very, very beautiful, very, very impressive, and you have a very appreciative audience. Here we are in Hangzhou, famous for the Song Dynasty. Is there one style associated with the Song Dynasty scholars? For the dynasties following the Han, there were lots of changes in style. The Song Dynasty had its own calligraphy orientation. It was more free, more able to express inner feelings. Each era had its own style. As far as art is concerned, the Wei and Jing periods were the most creative. In the Tang Dynasty, law and regulations were emphasized. In the Song Dynasty, they wanted to walk in a different road. Cultured people were more natural, living in a different historic climate, and this more expressive literati created a more expressive style. My English name, when said in Chinese, is not good. Last thup. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it means trash can. So many years ago, I asked my Chinese friend to find a good Chinese name for me. And it's Su Bo Le. Oh, I must use this. This is a Guan Yao brush washer. OK, here we go. Mm. Next bit is something like this. And the next bit is... Um, Are you good? <laughs> <laughs> Run by academics, Sung society was calm and ordered. And in order lies contentment, a precept of Confucianism. When the brush washer was made, Confucius had been dead for nearly 1,500 years. But the sudden Sung resurrected interest in the philosopher. The study of his teachings and precepts regarded then and now as the pursuit of scholars. Confucius, perhaps one of the most famous philosophers of all time, was born in 551 BC. He was a minister in the state of Lu, and there he is. Famous for his sayings, many of which, of course, are apocryphal, but in fact, an amazing man. He set the entire basis for the way in which China has been run in the two and a half thousand years ever since. He believes in proper relationships, that we have a duty from one person to another, from superior to inferior and vice versa, and believes that a state that knows what those relationships are is a well-ordered state and one which will succeed. A society run by thinkers is a well-ordered one. But what else does the tale of the scholars tell us about the Chinese? That they've